Hello, welcome to chapter 62 through 70 of Life of Pi. Here we go. Uh, chapter 62. I slept in fits that night. Shortly before sunrise, I gave up trying to fall asleep again and lifted myself on an elbow. I spied with my little eye a tiger. Richard Parker was restless. He was moaning and growling and pacing about the lifeboat. It was impressive. I assessed the situation. He couldn't be hungry, or at least not dangerously hungry. Was he thirsty? His tongue hung from his mouth, but only on occasion, and he was not panting. And his stomach and paws were still wet, but they were not dripping wet. There, were probably, there probably wasn't much water left in the boat. Soon, he would be thirsty. I looked up at the sky. The cloud cover had vanished, but for a few wisps on the horizon, the sky was clear. It would be another hot, rainless day. The sea moved in a lethargic way, as if already exhausted by the oncoming heat. I sat against the mast and thought about our problem. The biscuits and the fishing gear assured us of the solid part of our diet. It was the liquid part that was the rub. It all came down to what was so abundant around us, but marred by salt. And I, I could perhaps mix some seawater with his fresh water, but I had to procure more fresh water to start with. The cans would not last long between the two of us. In fact, I was loath to even share one with Richard Parker, and it would be foolish to rely on rainwater. The solar stills were the only other possible source of drinkable water. I looked at them doubtfully. They had been put out two days now. I noticed that none of them, that one of them had lost a little air. I pulled on the rope to tend to it. I topped off its cone with air. Without any real expectation, I reached underwater for the dist distillate pouch that was, clapped, was clipped to the round buoyancy chamber. My fingers took hold of a butt bag that was unexpectedly flat, fat. A shiver of thrill went through me. I controlled myself. As likely as not, salt water had leaked in. I unhooked the pouch and following the instructions, lowered it and tilted the still so that any more water from beneath the cone might flow into it. I closed the two small taps that led to the pouch, detached it and pulled it out of the water. It was rectangular in shape and made of thick, soft yellow plastic with calibration marks on one side. I tasted the water. I tasted it again. It was salt free. There's a picture of the still. My sweet sea cow, I exclaimed to the solar still, you've produced and how, what a delicious milk. Mind you, a little rubbery, but I'm not complaining. Why, look at me drink. I finished the bag. It had a capacity of one liter and, I was, and was nearly full. After a moment of sigh producing, shut-eyed satisfaction, I reattached the pouch. I checked the other stills. Each one had an utter similar, similarly heavy. I collected the fresh milk, over eight liters of it, in the fish bucket. Instantly, these technological contraptions became, a pre became as precious to me as cattle are to a farmer. Indeed, as they floated placidly in an ark, they looked almost like cows grazing in a field. I ministered to their needs, making sure that there was enough seawater inside each and that the cones and chambers were inflated to just the right pressure. After adding a little seawater to the bucket's contents, I placed it on the side bench just beyond the tarpaulin. With the end of the morning coolness, Richard Parker seemed safely settled below. I tied the bucket in place using rope and the tarpaulin, hooks on the side of the boat. I carefully peeked over the gunnel. He was lying on his side. His den was a foul sight. The dead mammals were heaped together, a grotesque pile of decayed animal parts. I recognized a leg or two, various patches of hide, parts of a head, a great number of bones. Flying fish wings were scattered, scattered about. I cut up a flying fish and tossed a piece into the side bench. After I had gathered what I needed for the day from the locker and was ready to go, I tossed another piece over the tarpaulin in front of Richard Parker. It had the intended effect. As I drifted away, I saw him come out into the open to fetch the morsel of fish. His head turned and he noticed the other morsel and the new object next to it. He lifted himself up. He hung his huge head over the bucket. I was afraid he would tip it over. He didn't. His face disappeared into it, barely fitting, and he started to lap up the water. In very little time, the bucket started shaking and rattling emptily with each strike of his tongue. When he looked up, I stared him, stared him aggressively in the eyes and blew on the whistle a few times. He disappeared under the tarpaulin. It occurred to me that with every passing day, the lifeboat resembling a, was resembling a zoo enclosure more and more. Richard Parker had his sheltered area for sleeping and resting, his food stashed, his lookout, and now his water hole. The temperature climbed. The heat became stifling. I spent the rest of the day in the shade of the canopy, fishing. It seems I had had, had beginner's luck with that first Dorado. I caught nothing the whole day, not even in, in the late afternoon when marine life appeared in abundance. A, tur a turtle turned up, a different kind this time, a green sea turtle bulkier and smoother shelled, but curious in the same way as a hawksbill. I did nothing about it, but I started thinking that I should. The only good thing about that the day being so hot was the sight the solar stills presented. 
Every cone was covered on the side with drops of rivulets of condensation. The day ended. I calculated that the next morning would mark make it a week since the Simpson had sunk. Chapter 63. The Robertson family survived six, 38 days at sea. Captain Bly of the celebrated mutinous bounty and his fellow castaways survived 47 days. Stephen Callahan survived 76. Owen Chase, who account, whose account of the sinking of the whaling ship Essex by a whale inspired Herman Melville, survived 83 days at sea with two mates, interrupted by a one-week stay on an inhospitable island. The Bailey family survived 118 days. I have heard of a Korean merchant sailor named Poon, I believe, who survived the Pacific for 173 days in the 1950s. I survived 227 days. That's how long my trial lasted, over seven months. I kept myself busy. That was one key to my survival. On a lifeboat, even on a raft, there's always something that needs needs doing. On an average day for me, if such a notion can be applied to a castaway, went like this. Sunrise to mid-morning. Wake up. Prayers. Breakfast for Richard Parker. General inspection of raft and lifeboat with particular attention paid to all knots and ropes. Tending of solar stills, wiping, inflating, topping off with water. Breakfast and inspection of food stores. Fishing and preparing of fish of any caught, gutting, cleaning, hanging of strips of flesh on lines secure in the sun. Mid-morning to late afternoon, prayers, not light lunch, rest and restful activities, writing and diary, examining of scabs and sores, uh, upkeeping of equipment, puttering about locker, observation and study of Richard Parker, picking out of turtle bones, etc. Late afternoon to early evening, prayers, fishing and preparing of fish, tending of curing strips of tending or of curing strips of fresh flesh. Turning over, cutting away of putrid parts. Dinner preparation. Dinner for self and Richard Parker. Sunset. General inspection of raft and lifeboat. Knocks and knots and ropes again. Collecting and safekeeping of distillate from solar stills. Storing of all foods and equipment. Arrangement for night. Making of bed. Safe storage of raft on on raft of flare in case of ship, and rain catcher in case of rain. Prayers. Night. Fitful sleeping. Prayers. Mornings were usually better than late afternoons when the emptiness of time tended to make itself felt. Any numbers, number of events affected this routine. Rainfall at any time of the day or night stopped all other business for as long as it fell. I held up the rain catchers and would, was feverishly occupied storing their catch. A turtle's visit was another magic, major disruption. And Richard Parker, of course, was a regular disturbance. Accommodating him was a priority I could not neglect for an instant. He didn't have much of a routine beyond eating, drinking, and sleeping, but there were times when he when he stirred from his lethargy and rambled about his territory, making noises and being cranky. Thankfully, every time the sun and the sea quickly tired him and he returned to returned to beneath the tarpaulin, to lying on his side again or flat on his stomach, his head on top of his crossed front legs. But there was was more to my dealings with him than strict necessity. I also, also spent hours observing him because it was a distraction. A tiger is a fascinating animal at any time, and all the more so when it's your, it is your sole companion. At first, looking out for a ship was something I did all the time, compulsively. But after a few weeks, five or six, I stopped doing it nearly entirely. And I survived because I made a point of forgetting. My story started on a, on a calendar day, July 2nd, 1977, and ended on a calendar day, February 14th, 1978. But in between, there was no calendar. I did not count the days or the weeks or the months. Time is an illusion that only makes us pant. I survived because I forgot even the very notion of time. What I remember are events and encounters and routines, markers that emerged here and there from this ocean of time and imprinted themselves on my memory. The smell of spent hand flare sick shells, and prayers at dawn, and the killing of turtles, and the biology of algae, for example, and many more. But I don't know if I can put them in order for you. My memories come in a jumble. Chapter 64. My clothes disintegrated, victims of the sun and the salt. First they became gauze thin, then they tore until only the seams were left. Lastly, the seams broke. For months I lived stark naked, except for the whistle that dangled from my neck by a string. Salt water boils, red, angry, disfiguring, where a leprosy of the high seas, transmitted by the water that soaked me. Where they burst, my skin was exceptionally sensitive. Accidentally rubbing an open sore was so painful I would gasp out and cry. Naturally, these boils developed on the parts of my body that got the most wet and the most wear of the raft, that is, my backside. There were days when I could hardly find a position in which I could rest. Time and sunshine healed a sore, but the process was slow and new boils appeared if I didn't stay dry. Chapter 65. I spent hours trying to decipher the lines of the survival manual on navigation. Plain and simple explanations 
of living off the sea were given in abundance, but a basic knowledge of seafaring was assumed by the author of the manual. The castaway was to, was to his mind an experienced sailor who, compass, chart, and sextant in hand, knew how he knew he found his way into trouble. Knew how he found his way into trouble, if not how he would get out of it. The result was advice such as, remember, time is distance. Don't forget to wind your watch. Or, latitude can be measured with the fingers if need be. I had a watch, but it was now at the bottom of the Pacific. I lost it when a Simpson sank. As for latitude and longitude, my marine knowledge was strictly limited, limited to what lived in the sea and did not extend to what cruised on top of it. Winds and currents were a mystery to me. The stars meant nothing to me. I couldn't name a single constellation. My, memory, my family lived by one star alone, the sun. We were early to bed and early to rise. I had in my life looked at the number of beautiful star looked at a number of beautiful starry nights, where with just two colors and the simplest of styles, nature draws the grandest of pictures. And I felt the feelings of wonder and smallness that we all feel, and I got a clear sense of direction from the spectacle, most definitely. But I mean that in a spiritual sense, not in a geographic one. Not in a geographic one. I hadn't the faintest idea how the night sky might serve as a road map. How could the stars sparkle as they might? help me find my way if they were if they kept moving i gave up trying to find out any knowledge i might gain was useless i had no means of controlling where i was going no rudder no sails no motor some oars but insufficient brawn what was the point of plotting a course if i could not act on it and even if i could how should i know where to go west back to where i came from east to america north to asia south to where the shipping lanes were each seemed a good and bad course in equal equal measure so i drifted winds and currents decided where i went Time became distance for me in the way it is for all mortals. I traveled down the road of life, but I did other things with my fingers than to try to than try to measure latitude. I found out later that I traveled a narrow road, the Pacific Equatorial Countercurrent. Chapter 66. I fished with a variety of hooks at a variety of depths for a variety of fish, from deep sea fishing with large hooks and many sinkers to surface fishing with smaller hooks and only one or two sinkers. Success was slow to come, and when it did, it was much appreciated, but the effort seemed out of proportion to the reward. The hours were long, the fish were small, and Richard Parker was forever hungry. It was the gaffs that finally provided, proved to be my most valuable fishing equipment. They came in three screw-in screw -in pieces, two tubular sections that formed the shaft, one with a molded plastic handle at the end and a ring for securing the gaff with a rope, and a head that consisted of a hook measuring about two inches across its curve and, and ending in a needle-sharp barbed point. Assembled, each gaff was about five feet long and felt as light and sturdy as a sword. At first, I fished in open water. I would sink the gaff to a depth of four feet or so, sometimes with a fish speared on the hook as bait, and I would wait. Sometimes I would wait for hours, my body tense till it ached. When a fish was just a was in just the right spot, I jerked the gaff up with all the might and speed it could muster. It was a split second decision. Experience taught me that it was better to strike when I felt I had a good chance of success than to strike wildly. For a fish learns from experience too, and rarely falls for the same trap twice. When I was lucky, a fish was properly snagged on the hook, impaled, and I could confidently bring it aboard. But if I gaffed a large fish in the stomach or tail, it would get away with a twist and a forward spurt of speed. Injured, it would be easy prey for another predator, a gift I had not meant to make. So, with large fish, I aimed for the ventral area beneath the gills under the lateral fins, for a fish's instinctive reaction when struck, struck there was to swim up, away from the hook, in the very direction I was pulling. Thus, it would happen. Sometimes more pricked than actually gaffed, a fish would burst out of the water in my face. I quickly lost my revulsion at touching, a sea, at touching sea life. None of this prissy fish blanket business anymore. A fishing, fish jumping out of water was confronted by a famished boy with a hands-on, no-holds-barred approach to capturing it. If I felt the gaff's hold was uncertain, I would let it go. I had not forgotten to secure it with a, with, with a rope to, to the raft, and I would clutch at the fish with my hands, fingers through the blunt, Though blunt, were far more nimble than a hook. The struggle would be fast and furious. Those fish were slippery and desperate, and I was just plain desperate. If only I had as many arms as the goddess Durga, two, two to hold the gaffs, four to grasp the fish, and two to wield the hatchets. But I had to make do with two. I st stuck fingers into eyes, jammed hands into gills, crushed soft stomachs with knees, bit tails with my teeth. I did whatever was necessary to hold a, hold a fish down until I could reach for the hatchet and chop its head off. What time and experience I became a better with time and experience I became a better hunter. I grew bolder and more agile. I defended. I developed an instinct, a feel for what to do. 
My success improved greatly when I started using part of the cargo net. As a fishing net, it was useless, too stiff and heavy, and with a weave that wasn't tight enough. But it was perfect as a lure. Trailing freely in the water, it provided irresistibly, it proved irresistibly attractive to fish, and even more so when seaweed started growing on it. Fish that were local in their ambit made the net their neighborhood, and the quick ones, the ones that tended to streak by, the Dorados, slowed down to visit the new development. Neither the residents nor the travelers ever suspected that a hook was hidden in the weave. There were some days, too few, unfortunately, where I could have all the fish I cared to gaff. At such times, I hunted far beyond the needs of my hunger or my capacity to cure. There simply wasn't enough space on the lifeboat or lines of the raft to try so many to dry so many strips of Dorado, flying fish, jacks, groupers, and mackerels, let alone space in my stomach to eat them. I kept what I could and gave the rest to Richard Parker. During those days of plenty, I laid my hands on so many fish that my body began to glitter from all its fish scales that became stuck to it. I wore those spots of shine and silver like tilax, the marks of color that we Hindus, Hindus wear on our foreheads as symbols of the divine. If, same, if sailors had come upon me then, I'm sure they would have thought I was a fish god standing atop his kingdom and they wouldn't have stopped. Those were the good days. They were rare. Turtles were an easy catch indeed. As the survival manual said they were, turtles are under the hunting and gathering heading. They were they would go under gathering. Solid and build though they were like tanks, they were neither fast nor powerful swimmers. But just one hand gripped around a back flipper, it was possible to hold on to a turtle. But the survival manual failed to mention that the turtle caught was not a turtle had. It had it still needed to be brought aboard, and hauling a struggling 130-pound turtle aboard a lifeboat was anything but easy. It was a labor that demanded feats of strength worthy of Hanuman. I did it by bringing the victim alongside the bow of the boat, carapace against hull, and tying a rope to its neck and front flipper and back flipper. Then I pulled until I thought my arms would come apart and my head would explode. I ran the ropes around the tarpaulin hooks on the opposite side of the bow. Every time a rope yielded a little, I secured my gain before the rope slipped back. Inch by inch, a turtle was heaved out of the water. It took time. I remember one green sea turtle that hung from the side of the light boat for two days, the whole while thrashing about madly, free flippers beating in the air. Luckily, at that last stage, on the lip of the gunnel, it would often happen that a turtle would help me without meaning to. In an attempt to free its painfully twisted flippers, it would pull on them. If I pulled at the same moment, our conflicting efforts sometimes came together, and suddenly it would happen, easily, in the most dramatic fashion imaginable. A turtle would surge over the gunnel and slide onto the tarpaulin. I would fall back, exhausted but jubilant. Green sea turtles gave me gave more meat than hawksbills, and their belly shells were thinner, but they tended to be bigger than hawksbills, often too big to lift out of the water for the weakened castaway that I became. Lord, to think that I'm a strict vegetarian, to think that when I was a child, I always shuddered when I snapped open a banana because it sounded to me like the breaking of an animal's neck. I descended to a level of savagery I never imagined possible. Here's the turtle. Being the gunnel. Chapter 67. The underside of the raft became host to a multitude, multitude of sea life, like the net but smaller in form. I started with a soft green algae. It started with a soft green algae that clung to life to the life jackets. A stiffer algae of a darker kind joined. It did well and became thick. Animal life appeared. The first I saw were tiny transilogent shrimp, hardly tra hardly half an inch long. They were followed by fish no bigger than that no bigger that looked like they were they were permanently under X-ray. Their internal organs showed through their transparent skins. After that, I noticed the black worms with white spines, the green gelatinous slugs with the primitive limbs, the inch-long motley colored fish with pot bellies, and lastly, the crabs, half to three quarters of an inch across and brown in color. I tried everything but the worms, including the algae. Only the crabs didn't have an unpalatably bitter or salty taste. Every time they appeared, I popped them, popped them one after another into my mouth like candy until there were none left. I couldn't control myself. It was always a long wait between fresh crops of crabs. The whole of the life button invited life, life too, in the form of small gooseneck barnacles. I sucked their fluid, their flesh made for a good fishing bait. I became attached to these oceanic hitchhikers, though they weighed weighed the raft down a little. They provided distraction, like Richard Parker. I spent many hours doing nothing but lying on my side. A life jacket pushed out of place a few inches like a curtain from a window so that, so that I might have a clear view. What I saw was an upside down town, small, quiet, and peaceable, whose citizens were went about with the civ sweet civility of angels. The sight was a welcome relief for my frayed nerves. Chapter 68. My sleep pattern changed. Though I rested all the time, I rarely slept longer than an hour or so at a stretch, even at night. 
It was not the ceaseless, ceaseless motion of the sea that disturbed me, nor the wind. You get used to the lows the way you get used to the lumps in a mattress. It was apprehension and anxiety that roused me. It was remarkable how little sleep I, could, I got by on. Unlike Richard Parker, he became a champion napper. Most of the time, he rested beneath a tarpaulin. But on calm days when the sun was not too harsh and on calm nights, he came out. One of his favorite positions in the open was lying on the stern bench uh, on his side, stomach overhanging the edge of it, front and back legs extending down the side benches. It was a lot of tiger to squeeze onto a fairly narrow ledge, but he managed by it by making his back very round. When he was truly sleeping, he laid on his head and his front legs. But, but when his mood was slightly more active, he became he might choose to open his eyes and look around. He turned his head and lay his chin on the gunnel. Another favorite position of his was sitting with his back to me, his rear half resting on the floor of the boat and his front half on the bench, his art, his face buried into the stern, paused right behind, right next to his head, looking as if he were playing hide and seek, he were the one counting. In, the position, in this position, he tended to lie very still with only the occasional twitching of his ears to indicate that he was not necessarily sleeping. Chapter, chapter 69. On many nights, I was convinced I saw a light in the distance. Each time I set up a flare, when I had used up the rocket flares, I expended the hand flares. Were they ships that were the were they ships that they failed to see me? The light of rising or setting stars bouncing off the ocean, breaking waves, the moonlight, and the forlorn hope fashioned into illusion. Whatever the case, every time it was for nothing, never a result. Always the bitter emotion of hope raised and dashed. In time, I gave up entirely on being saved by a ship. If the horizon was two and a half miles away at an altitude of five feet, how far was it when I was sitting against the mast of my ra raft, my eyes not even three feet above the water? One chance was there that a ship crossing the great whole Pacific would cut into such a tiny circle. Not only that, that it would cut into such a tiny circle and see me. What chance was there of that? No, humanity and its unreliable ways could not be counted upon. It was land I had to reach, hard, firm, certain land. I remember the smell of the spent hand flare shells. By some freak of chemistry, it, they smelled exactly like cumin. It was, it was intoxicating. I sniffed the plastic shells and immediately pond and cherry came to life in my mind. A, marvelously, a marvelous relief from the disappointment of calling for help and not being heard. The experience was, not so, was very strong, nearly a hallucination. From a single smell, a whole town arose. Now when I smell cumin, I see the Pacific Ocean. Richard Parker always froze when a hand flare hissed to life. His eyes, round pupils the size of pinpricks, fixed on the light steadily. It was too bright for me, a white, a blinding white center with a pinkish red or aureole. I had to turn away. I, heard, I held the flare in the air at the arm's length and waved it slowly. For about a minute, head, heat showered down upon my forearm and everything was weirdly lit. Water around the raft until a moment before opaquely black showed itself to be crowded with fish. Chapter 70. Butchering a turtle was hard work. My first one was a small hawksbill. It was its blood that tempted me, the good, nutritious, salt-free drink promised by the survival manual. My thirst was that bad. I took hold of the turtle shell and grappled with one of its back flippers. When I had a good grip, I turned it over in the water and attempted to pull it onto the raft. The thing was thrashing violently. I would never be able to deal with it on the raft. Either I let, let it go or try my luck on a lifeboat. I looked up. It was hot and cloudless day. Richard Parker seemed to tolerate my presence at the bow on such days when the air was like the inside of an oven and he did not move from under the tarpaulin until sunset. I held on to the, one of the turtle's back flippers with one hand and I pulled on the rope to the lifeboat with the other. It was not easy climbing aboard. When I had managed it, I jerked the turtle in the air and brought it onto its back onto the tarpaulin. As I had hoped, Richard Parker did no more than growl once or twice. He was not up to exerting himself in such heat. My determination was grim and blind. I felt I had no time to waste. I turned to the survival manual as to the cookbook. It said to lay the turtle on its back. Done. It advised that the knife should be inserted into the neck to sever the arteries and veins running through it. I looked at the turtle. There was no neck. The turtle had retracted into its shell. All that showed of its head was its eyes and its beak, surrounded by circles of skin. It was looking at me, me upside down with a stern expression. I took hold of the knife and hoping to goad it, poked a front flipper. It only shrank further into its shell. I decided on a more direct approach. As confidently as I had done it a thousand times, I jammed the knife just to the right of the turtle's head at an angle. I pushed the blade deep into the fold of skin and twisted it. 
the, tur the turtle retreated even further, favoring the side where the, flade, where the blade was, and suddenly shot its head forward, beak snapping at me viciously. I jumped back. All four flippers came out, and the creature tried to make its getaway. It rocked on its back, flippers beating wildly and heads shaking from side to side. I took hold of a hatchet and brought it down on the turtle's neck, gashing it. Bright blood, red blood shot out. I grabbed a beaker and collected about 300 milliliters, a pop can's worth. I might have got much more, a liter, I would guess, but the turtle's beak was sharp and its front flippers were long and powerful, with two claws on each. The blood I managed to collect gave off no particular smell. I took a sip. It tasted warm and animal, if my memory is right. It's hard to remember its first impressions. Remember first impressions. I drank the blood to the last drop. I thought I would use the hatchet to remove the tough belly shell, but it proved easier with the sawtooth edge of the knife. I set one foot at the center of the shell and the other clear of the flailing flippers. The leathery skin at the head of the shell was easy cutting, except around the flippers. Sawing away at the rim, however, was rim where, the sh where shell met shell was very hard work, especially as the turtle wouldn't stop moving. By the time I had gone all the way around, I was bathed in sweat and exhausted. I pulled on the belly shell. It lifted reluctantly with a wet sucking sound. Inner life was revealed, twitching and jerking, muscles, fat, blood, gut, and bones. And still the turtle thrashed about. I slashed at its neck to the vertebrae. It made no difference. Flippers continued to beat. With two blows of the hatchet, I cut off its head right off. The flippers did not stop. Worse, the security head went on gulping for air and blinking its eyes. I pushed it into the sea. The living rest of the turtle I lifted and dropped into Richard Parker's territory. He was making noises and sounded if you, as if he were about to stir. He had probably smelled the turtle's blood. I fled to the raft. I watched sullenly as he loudly appreciated my gift and made a joyous mess of himself. I was utterly spent. The effort of butchering the turtle had hardly seemed worth the cup of blood. I started thinking seriously about how I was going to deal with Richard Parker. This forbearance on his part was hot, on hot, cloudless days. That is what it was. And not simple laziness was not good enough. I couldn't always be running away from him. I needed safe access to the locker and to the top of the tarpaulin, no matter the time of day or, or the weather, no matter his mood. It was rights I needed, the sort of rights that came with my, come with might. It was time to impose myself and carve out my territory. And that is all for today. Ta-ta.